So I'm reading to you from uh, Proverbs chapter 1, and what I'm going to do is just kind of pick out a few passages uh, from Proverbs 1, 2, and 3. Proverbs 1, 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a discipline and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add their learning, and let the discerning get guidance, for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Skipping over to verse 20, Wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery? And fools hate wisdom. Moving to chapter 2, verse 1. My son... If you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you will look for it as, as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Verse 12, wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are perverse, who lead the straight paths and walk in the dark ways. Chapter 3, verse 1, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commandments in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. And then uh, this is verse 13 and following. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. By wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the deeps were divided, and the clouds let drop the dew. I submit to you that Shakespeare could never write anything as beautiful as the words we read here tonight. Now, what we're doing, next slide, is that, and by the way, notice the uh, treasure trove and the treasure chest and all that because we just read from the book of Proverbs that uh, wisdom is a treasure. It's something that, it, that we are to count as, as being very, very uh, precious to us. And so we're talking about wisdom tonight. Now, uh, as I said this morning, there is wisdom and then there is wisdom. And what I mean by that is that God's wisdom is far above the wisdom of human beings, even though human beings can muster a certain amount of education and knowledge and understanding and gain a great deal of wisdom. And I remember when I was a, a young man, about when I say young, I'm talking my days on the construction job, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. And I worked with some guys who were decades older than and I learned some principles from them 
that I've used uh, all the rest of my life, things that have benefited me, you know, uh, uh, the ways to accomplish something or to go about something. And, uh, and, and uh, I won't bore you with some of those, but, but I learned a lot from those guys. But here's what we're saying tonight, and that is that human beings can be too prideful in their own wisdom, so prideful that they don't think that God is wiser than they are, and the Corinthians were an example of that. And so we're going to the book of 1 Corinthians now. 1 Corinthians. And we're going to kind of fly over chapters 1 and 2. I'll begin in verse 1. And um, we're going to uh, begin reading in verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. He's quoting from Isaiah 29, verse 14. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand a miraculous sign, and Greeks look for wisdom or education. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews. The reason is crucifixion was what was done to criminals, someone who had done something wrong. And so they couldn't process that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of God, was crucified because that's what happens to criminals. And so uh, it was, uh, it was a, um, a stumbling block to them. Back to verse 23. And to, to the Jews it was, uh, and foolishness to the Gentiles, I should say. By foolishness it simply meant that it didn't make sense. Here's what they were saying. They were using human logic and they were saying, now, why would God, if there is a God, why would he send his son to be killed in order to save people? Why would he allow his son to, to suffer in order to save people? Why would he, uh, you know, resurrect his son? And, and why would he go through all that? And they would say, that does not make sense. No smart person I know, they would say, would go about trying to rescue someone by going through an, an exercise like that. It just, well, it, they, it just was foolishness to them. And so, verse 25, for the foolishness of God, I should read verse 24 first, but to those who are called, who, whom God is called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. And so here we see um, how that godly wisdom is contrasted with human wisdom, and I think it's, uh, it's a very uh, interesting thing. I'm going to read something to you now from an article written by Wayne Jackson. Now, you might not know who Wayne Jackson is. He's a, a brother in the Lord. He lives in uh, Stockton, California, and he writes prolifically. As a matter of fact, I have, I've not read everything he's written, but I have never read anything that he has written that is poorly done. It's always excellent. So I'm going to read you a couple of excerpts. This is uh, based upon what I just read you from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Greeks, or the Gentiles, vaunted in their alleged wisdom. Herodotus reported that these intellectual sophisticates had the reputation of pursuing every kind of knowledge. Celsus a Greek philosopher who wrote a bitter diatribe against Christianity characterized the followers of Jesus as those who eschewed wisdom. In other words, uh, uh, were against it, so to speak. But who welcomed the senseless and the ignorant. The Greeks viewed these outside the pale of Hellenism as barbarians. In other words, if you were not in their in crowd, then you were a barbarian. And that include, included the Jews and the Lord and, and, uh, and the prophets and everyone else. He says this, he says, the apostles, or the apostle Paul, sets the philosophy of those who are under the spell of worldly wisdom in stark contrast to the disposition of those who yield 
to heaven's redemptive plan, which culminate in the cross. By and large, both Jew and Gentile fail to recognize the true wisdom of God. A crucified Messiah was a stumbling block to the Hebrews or the Jews and to the Gentile pseudo-intellectuals the idea of a vicarious sacrifice for sin was sheer foolishness. Now vicarious is a uh, is what they call a 50 cent word. But what it means is doing something in, in the place of someone that was not a substitute. And so Jesus was the substitute for us. He took the penalty that we deserve. Such rebels would be dealt with eventually. In the meantime, any who accepted the call of God through the gospel, whether Jew or Gentile, could be saved from sin through the work of Christ, who is the manifestation of power and the wisdom of God. Next slide. Um, the next slide is, the, you might say, the summary of uh, what is being taught in First and Second in First Corinthians chapters one and two. It's this, verse five, of First Corinthians two, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom but on God's power. And God's power is the, the, the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of His precious and only Son, Jesus Christ. And so Paul makes sure that no one will credit human wisdom with the salvation of souls. Next slide. God chose to save the world with a message. And again, what is the message? Well, the, the message is that God loves the world, uh, that, uh, that human beings are sinners, that there is a penalty for sin, and that human beings can't pay the penalty. So God decides to pay the penalty for us because He loves us. So He sends His Son as the perfect sacrifice to shed innocent blood uh, and, to, and to be killed and to, to, be, to suffer and to be killed on the cross, the most shameful way to die be buried and then resurrected. And so that's the message. Well, uh, that's, that's, verse, uh, that's 1 Corinthians 1.23. Let's read that. But we preach Christ crucified. That's the message that God chose to save the world. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. You see, to the lost, the message of the cross is nonsense. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now to the saved, the message of the cross is the power of God, verse 24 in 1 Corinthians 1. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Next slide. The scripture says here that God is calling us now, we're going to learn uh, uh, that God calls us by that message. He doesn't call us on the telephone. Uh, he doesn't call us like He called the Apostle Paul by striking us down and striking us blind. Uh, like Paul, like what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. But the scripture says this in 2 Thessalonians 2, 14. He called us by our gospel and that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this does not appeal to those who arrogantly trust in their own wisdom. Uh, uh, you see, humility is required in order to become a Christian, and in order to get forgiveness of sin. And pride and forgiveness of sin don't mix. It takes a humbling of oneself, and, a, and, 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 and it takes a getting down off the throne of our own wisdom, and humbling ourselves before God who is far wiser than we are. There's a passage in Isaiah 55 uh, that says, God saying to us, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. And as far as, the, as, the, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. He's so much wiser than we are. And so, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, he says this. He says, brothers and sisters, think not... <coughs> Think of what you were when you were called. Not many were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to, sh to, to shame the strong. 
God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us the wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let no one who boasts Boast in the Lord. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Why? Because it is the Lord who is wise, and it is the Lord, the Lord who is strong, and it is the Lord who is the one who is able to save. Next slide. Here he says that the messenger is weak. And if, if I understand this correctly, God deliberately chooses weak people and weak things to deliver a message that is strong, so strong that it's able to see. And so uh, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 and following. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence of human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He said, I, uh, you know, I didn't come to talk to you about the philosophy. I didn't come to talk to you about this, that, and the other, and the things that they talk about in the secular universities. I just came to talk to you about one thing. And he says, even that, he said, I didn't do it in an eloquent way. I came to talk to you about Jesus and Him crucified. Verse 3, I came to you in weakness and with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So Paul says that his presentation and his presence uh, demonstrated that the power of God came from the Holy Spirit and not from him as a human being. You see, Christianity is a divine system. It comes from God, not from people. Human beings didn't invent Christianity. Uh, there are no founders of Christianity uh, made of flesh and blood. Jesus Christ is the foundation of all things pertaining to Christianity. One time when I was uh, young, but not only young, foolish, I was uh, 29 years old, and I did a meeting in Pataskala, Ohio, I wish I hadn't said that. This is being recorded, isn't it? But anyway, I, uh, I was there to do a three-day meeting, and I deliberately got there right at the last minute and shook a few hands and went on up and sat on the front. And, and uh, then uh, they, we had the song service, and they introduced Brother Jones, and I get up there, and I, 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 I go something like this. It is so wonderful to be here with you tonight. I have been looking forward to and I go on like this like I've got a speaking time. And the people begin to sink down in their seats and they're thinking, they look at each other like, three days of this? This guy can't even speak normally, you know. So I go on for a few, you know, a few lines like that. And then I said, I said, time out, folks. I said, um, I just want to ask you one question. If I was handicapped, would you accept me? And I said, even if I couldn't talk correctly, would you still be willing to listen to the gospel because it's the gospel that saves. Not smooth talking, eloquent orators. It's the message, not the weak vessels that we human beings are that makes the difference. Okay, next slide. God's wisdom has to be revealed. I want to read something to you also that I picked up from Wayne Jackson's article. God's plan, which is the wise plan, was secretly worked out through the ages and it could not be identified by human ingenuity. The most educated rulers were so blind that they became spiritual fools. This is evidenced by the crucifying of the Lord of glory. And, and, and because you see, the, 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 their intellectual acumen left them clueless, even though the prophets were consistently telling them of the Messiah. The divine scheme or plan had to be revealed to humanity. The mind of God can only be known when the Holy Spirit reveals it. Just as 
You don't know as a human being what I, as a human being, am thinking. You're not going to know what I'm thinking until I tell you what I'm thinking. And he says the same thing is true of God's mind. We're not going to know of God's mind unless he tells us what he's thinking. And then the next slide, I'm going to bring this in for a landing. And he, he contrasts the spiritual uh, with the unspiritual. And the natural man stands in contrast to the spiritual man. And he, and he, he, he identifies in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, that the natural man, or the unspiritual man, is the man who does not know God. Because he has not put his trust in God. He has put his trust in his own intellect, in his own power to reason, in his own logic, in his own wisdom. He's decided that he's smart enough uh, to, to figure everything out. And as a result of that, he remains an unspiritual person. We begin to grow spiritually the day we realize that the way of our lives are not in ourselves. That's Jeremiah 10, 23. Oh, Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own footsteps. So we need the mind of God to be revealed to us in order for us to become spiritual people. Because God is a spirit, John 4, 24. And when we yield to him and trust him and, and live according to his wisdom, not ours alone, then we become spiritual people. The last slide. Um, is the plan of salvation. And this plan of salvation is nonsense to people who are perishing. That's what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2. But it's the power of God and the salvation unto those who are willing to accept the wisdom of God over of their own wisdom. Tonight as we sing this song of encouragement, if you've not yet yielded to the power and the wisdom of God, and put, set aside your own wisdom in order to be saved, then we encourage you, as one who has heard the gospel tonight, willing to uh, believe, of course, repent of sins, confess faith in Jesus, and receive baptism, to receive the power of God, the wisdom of God, and the salvation offered us through Christ. Would you come to him if you need to right now while together we stand and sing?